Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here this afternoon. I know it's tough competition with lunch. Um, but I'm really excited to have everyone here today. And I'd like to talk a little bit and, and put us in a scenario. Um, and for many of you, this, this is reality. It's not a hypothetical exercise. But let's imagine for a moment that you have no secure rights to the land you live on. No title, deed, or lease. Uh, no confidence that the government will recognize your right, much less protect your right. No real security that the place you call home, the, the place that gives you um, security, uh, your livelihoods, and a sense of identity will be protected. In fact, it might even be the government that is issuing the concession over the land you occupy without so much as a consultation, much less consent. Now in this scenario, how likely would you be to invest in your home to improve the property? How likely would you be to leave land fallow even if it's past peak productivity or leave a house absent while you travel uh, to a distant to, to visit somebody? Probably unlikely, because you know that your occupancy is the primary claim to the land. How would this, uh, this informality affect your ability to plan for the future, to use your community's land as an asset, to share in the benefits from, the, from, the, from your land rights, or potentially to pass that land on to your children? For a majority of the world's populations, these are not rhetorical questions. Whether in urban slums where over 32% of the world's population, urban population currently lives, or in rural farms, the world over, there's a lack of tenure security. Particularly at risk are minority groups, marginalized groups, whether indigenous, whether customary, or women. And we must recognize that in 90 countries across the world, it's still uh, laws and norms reflect an imbalance uh, in women's land rights. The reality is functioning, equitable land administration systems only exist in a fraction of the world, leaving more than 70% of the land informal and undocumented. So how do we address this? Let's take, for example, the case of Uganda. In 2014, Uganda had approximately 18 million parcels, by some estimates, with 3, 000, 3 million of those documented. So 15 million parcels undocumented. And at the time, the legal process required a government surveyor sign off on each new parcel. With 26 surveyors uh, doing, on average, 550 parcels per year, how long is it going to take to finish documenting Uganda? A thousand years. A thousand years, and that assumes that no transactions occur for the next thousand years. Nobody dies, nobody sells a property, no one trades. We have a static system. Obviously, there's a need to address this failed public good that many countries aren't, able to, aren't currently executing. For those households and communities left out of formal, formal tenure, tenure systems, it is now possible to take land uh, to take matters into their own hands. And while participatory and community mapping have existed for decades, if not longer, technology has fundamentally altered the way this can be accomplished. Now the data can be captured in a more structured way um, and much, make it much easier to collect and manage this data and ensure it adheres to standards national standards or even international standards, so that that, that data can, can be recognized by government. Now, with the average smartphone, any community data collector now has in their hand a more powerful and oftentimes accurate tool for data collection than most surveyors were using 20 years ago. And that's to say nothing of the ability to also capture pictures audio files, video files, that can all build evidence of one's rights. In addition to the ability to use satellite imagery and take it out into the field on a phone so that the community sees what data you collect. No longer is there a shroud of secrecy as they look at a, a, a string of coordinates and are promised that represents their, their land claim. Now we can look at it overlaid and see that that directly does align with the community's understandings of boundaries. Simply put, technology is democratizing land administration. 
No longer is this a field that's strictly in the hands of lawyers, surveyors, and government actors. Instead, communities can take an active role in planning for their community, advocating for their rights, and even administering and managing their land. And that's our goal at Cadasta. We'd like to provide the tools, the support, and the services to these communities to allow them to focus on their community using the data, leveraging it. And we've seen this approach work with partners around the world. In the Indian state of Odisha, for example, we worked with the state government and Tata Trust, an NGO. As part of the program there, over 600 community data collectors from urban slums Direct, members of the community lived in the slums, know the slums. They were trained by government officials to be the data collectors and the surveyors, and they're trusted by the communities because they're a part of the communities. In this past year and a half, 600 data collectors have documented 120,000 households, improving the tenure security of a million people, and the first 70,000 households have already see, received their formal recognition of rights. This wouldn't be possible with government officials or with government surveyors. It could be done quickly, cheaply, equitably, and with trust because it's done by community members. Of course, there's still a role for government to review and check the data, but now that's a decentralized role. Or take, for example, the case of the Ogek people in Kenya. The Ogek people worked to use tools to capture evidence of their historical land claims across, uh, across state forests in Kenya. Claims that the government of Kenya has never recognized. They used this data to lodge a, a case within the African court on human and people's rights. And in fact, were, were awarded uh, and justified for reparations from the Kenyan government. So data collected locally that was not accepted by the national government has been accepted by an international body that's recognizing their rights. So we can see how with a few simple and accessible tools, we have the ability to change the way things are done in the land space. We can make the invisible visible, we can make the informal formal. And we don't have to wait a thousand years, we don't have to wait a hundred years, we don't have to wait 10 years, we can do it today. So will you join us? Thank you.